trying to get you to forgive me if I yawn uh, during my own sermon. It's not because I think my sermon's boring or anything, but I don't know what's been going on lately. The moon's been out, you know, nice and cool, and so I just, man, I haven't been able to sleep. And when the moon came out, I also started to grow some facial hair, too. I don't know. I don't know if I should be concerned about that or not. Yeah, it's, I don't know if there's any correlation. Um, and then people online are going to be like squinting their eyes like, I can't see anything anyway. So uh, aside from that, uh, if I were to ask you who comes to mind when you think of somebody who truly serves, uh, serves like Christ, who would you think of? Now, I know for me that I can think of several people in this congregation. Right now we have uh, Drew and we had Tyler. They've been serving, getting the, the meat ready for what we're going to do today, which is give it out to the community, right? Uh, so I, I can think of several people in this congregation, and one person that I definitely think of, and I think would, a lot of people here would first think of is, I know she won't like this, but Judy. Uh, Judy is such a servant-oriented person. Uh, and I know that any church, if they were to have somebody like Judy, they would be blessed by her, okay? And I know Judy, she doesn't do the things she does for attention or credit or whatever, but I just want to take a moment to appreciate her because she really is a servant like Christ. All right, and so I don't know who you think of, but another person I think of, his name is Keith. And now, Keith, he is somebody I, I met through Michaela, and Keith, he was, in fact, there for Michaela's family in a time of need, and now just for... Uh, context, Keith, he's a missionary. And so he, he's been to South America, he's done domestic missions, and he's sort of like a, I would describe a Swiss army knife of missionaries. See, he'll go to these places, but he doesn't just preach and teach, he'll also serve by doing hard manual labor. I think one time he helped construct a, a bridge or something and almost fell in the river, but yeah, he, he, he'll get down and do the hard work other than just preaching and teaching. And so we have people like Judy, like Keith, who are able to do various things to serve, whether it be teaching or whether it be serving by doing some sort of manual labor. Right? We have different kinds of servants. And sometimes some people are more, I guess you could say, one-dimensional, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people are able to serve just through ministry, and that's understandable because some people have physical issues where they can't get down and do the hard work, and that's all right. And so we have these Swiss Army knife of people who are servants, and then we have these more one-dimensional servants. And so in Philippians, uh, we've been there for the past, I think it's fourth week, right? Or fifth week. What does my sermon say? Fifth, part five. Okay, there we go. Got to remind myself. Philippians chapter two. We, we see these two servants. Uh, they're, they're different uh, servants and how they, they work. We have Timothy and we have Epaphroditus. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, we're going to walk through the text. So verse 19 says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. So what do we all know about Timothy? Well, Timothy, as we understand, he is a young minister. He's a young church Leader. Paul tells him in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, that you know, he shouldn't let anybody despise him for his youth or look down on him for, for his youth, but rather set an example for the believer. So he is a young church leader. Now we also know Timothy, he was kind of raised by his grandmother and mother, and those are the people that led him into faith. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it says this, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure that it dwells in you as well. All right now, we don't know where the father is. Maybe, maybe Timothy's father died, or maybe he's just not in the picture, but regardless, Timothy, he was raised, and he was, he was brought up in the faith by two faithful women. Now, let me tell you, I would not be here if not for Michaela. She's been such a faithful woman to God, and I would not be here without her. And I'm sure all of us can think of faithful women that have just influenced our lives with eternal ramifications. Continue on, verse 20, it says this, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Timothy, as a servant, has genuine concern for others. Now, the word for concern is actually an interesting one. Often it is translated as anxious. Now, an example of this is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 28. It says, And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they, uh, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. So that's that same word there translated as anxious. Now, another way this can be translated is to have one's thoughts occupied with. So Timothy, he's kind of anxious for his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's concerned about their well-being. He has his thoughts occupied with them. You see, anxiety is not all bad. Right. There's certainly a point where anxiety can become too much and it's detrimental to your health, but anxiety is not all that bad. See, if, what's the total lack of anxiety? If you have no anxiety for your loved ones, what is that called? That's called apathy. Right? And so Timothy has genuine concern. He has his thoughts occupied with his brothers and sisters. Now, in contrast, look at what Paul says in verse 21. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Those not of Jesus, they seek their own interests. They put themselves first, perhaps like those false teachers that Paul had already addressed in this earlier in this chapter, how they preach because of their own self-interest. Now remember, we talked about this earlier in the chapter also, that Paul, he, he said to, we ought to count others more significant than ourselves, right? Now Timothy, he displays this kind of selfless, this selflessness that was seen in Jesus. Remember that Christ him. It's called the Christ him that described Christ and what he went through, how he lived, how he died as a servant. Continuing on, verse 22. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel. Paul says that Timothy is like a son to him. Now, I don't think this is just a sentiment that he throws out. Okay, Paul, he seems to have been a father figure for Timothy. Remember, the father, uh, Timothy's father, is not in the picture as far as we know. Remember, Paul himself, he's not married, and he does not have kids of his own. So all things considered, Paul probably treated Timothy as his own son. But what's the significance of that? Why would it be important for Paul to treat Timothy as a son? Well, you've got to consider the historical context, right? See, if a father of a household died or was gone or absent for a long time, then the son, the oldest son, would be responsible for the household. And then usually the sons, they would go in the same business as the father. So consider Timothy. He stepped in for Paul. Paul, who is in prison, he is taking care of the family, that family being the family that is the body of Christ. And Timothy, he's also going into the family business. He, he's partaking of ministry. He's going into ministry after Paul. So I don't think Paul's just throwing out this sentiment that he's a son willy-nilly, right? Now, I, yeah, I, I just said willy-nilly, right? He's not just throwing this out there. I think Paul actually treats Timothy as his own son. Continuing on, verses 23 and 24, it says, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it goes with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also, now the good news is Paul was likely released and was probably able to see the Philippians again, but the bad news is probably about five years later after having written Philippians, he was arrested and he was killed, but that's beside the point. I want you to notice Timothy, who Timothy is as a servant who is genuinely concerned for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Continuing on in verse 25, we're introduced to Epaphroditus. Now, He's interesting because this is the only time where he's referred to, so this is as, as much as we know about him. So, verse 25 says this, I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. You see, Epaphroditus, he's kind of like that Swiss army knife of a, a servant. He's described as a brother, worker, soldier, messenger, and minister. He does a lot, right? He does a lot. Now, the only title I really want to focus on is soldier. What does it mean to be a soldier? Specifically, Paul calls him a fellow soldier. What makes him a soldier? Continue on, verses 26 through 30. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious to so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. See, that text right there, those, those verses, I think that's why Epaphroditus is described as a soldier. He's willing to risk 
uh, his life for the work of Christ. Now, part of what was detailed here, he's apparently taking something to Paul. Remember, he's called a messenger, and presumably he takes a message from the Philippians to Paul and vice versa, right? He takes a, a message from Paul to the Philippians. And so, what I want you to understand is that we're, we take modern technology for granted, right? We, we got our phones, we can send a text message across the world in the matter of a, f- a few seconds, right? But for them, they got messages out by letter. Now, they didn't even have mail systems like we had. Often, they had to have somebody volunteer to take a letter uh, across mountains and oceans. So, just for context, there, there should be a map. Could you get that up there on the next slide? Ooh, that's kind of hard to see. Let me get down here for a second. So, at the top left, you can see Rome, right? And then you see Philippi uh, to the right uh, under where it says Macedonia, right? You see Philippi and then you see Rome. And then what else do you see there? You see a mountain range between Philippi and you see some ocean between Philippi and Rome. See, this is why I think Paul calls him a soldier. Look at what he had to traverse just to get a message from the Philippians to Paul. He was willing to traverse an ocean and mountains for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Imagine somebody so concerned about their brothers and sisters that they would be willing to cross mountains and oceans for them. And yet today, many people have an issue with traveling 15 to 20 minutes in a car to get to church. Many people have an issue with waking up just an hour early to come to class to learn something out of Scripture. Many people have an issue with working and serving on their days off from work because they need their rest. We have a problem with visiting our brothers and sisters in Christ because we're worried about inconveniencing them and ourselves. Around the time of 160 AD, there was a plague in Rome and the Middle East, uh, probably in Egypt too. And this plague, it killed 5 to 10 million people. We're talking like a tenth of the population, total population. Uh, and at the time, that's the, the, the mortality rate was like 25%, right? And, and the thing is, it was probably something like smallpox, something that we can easily treat today. It just wiped out a tenth of the population then. And the thing is, there was a time when uh, many in pagan households, they would take their loved one who got sick, and they would just throw them out. That was their solution. You know, we don't want to get sick, so we're just going to throw you out the household, and you're going to die. But the thing is, there were many Christians, they would take care of the sick. Their own families, they would keep them in the household, they would feed them, they would take care of them. And not only that, the the pagans who were thrown outside, they would take them in, and they would take care of them. Even though they could have contracted the sickness and died, they took care of their brothers and sisters, and they took care of people who didn't even believe in God. Are we really soldiers of Christ? Or are we comfortable? I know I have been in times of my life. I've chosen comfort over being a soldier before. But when I look at the text, when I look at the disciples of Christ and what they were willing to do, I see soldiers. I see people who are willing to cross mountains and oceans just to get a letter to their brothers and sisters because they had a word from God to them. I see people willing to die. I see people willing to get sick for the sake of their brothers and sisters because they love Are we really soldiers? Are we really willing to lay down our lives? And if we're not to that point, and quite frankly, it might you might go back and forth. Sometimes you're able to be a soldier, and then sometimes you you recess, uh, you you revert back to your 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 afraid, faithless self. I get that. That happens. We gotta let Christ work on you. Being a soldier of Christ is not possible if Christ does not work on you. 
if he does not work on your heart, if he does not change your mind, you cannot be a soldier. So I ask you, are you going to let him work on you? Are you going to let him work on you to make you a soldier, make you a soldier like Paul, like Timothy, like Epaphroditus, like so many disciples we read about in Scripture? And you can take that first step. You can become a servant like Christ by putting him on in baptism so that he may change you from the inside out. You can come as we stand and sing.